recording right now. Hi everybody and welcome to this month's March 2017 meeting of the In Memory uh, Virtual Past Virtual Chapter and we have with us today as you know uh, Sunil uh, Agarwal from Microsoft with another great session uh, in depth about um, column store technology. But we, before I hand the mic off to Sunil, we have a couple of past community news to share with you. I promise it won't take more than a few minutes. Sunil, can you advance? So the first thing, PASS has been completely rebranded and the new website has been launched and we urge you to go visit the new website, um, update your profile, um, explore the, the different parts of the website, more opportunities to get involved with PASS. And of course, if you have any feedback, it's a new website. If something that you think can be improved, if you encounter um, any issue with the website, please, please let us know so we can make it better. Um, so Neil, next. So um, another thing. Um, New members join local groups. This is an incentive that goes on, um, as you can see, from March to May 31st. And we can provide um, benefits for people who will get us more engaged with, uh, will get more engaged with um, the past community. So uh, more on that to follow. Sunil, next. Um, as you know, this user group is part of a large uh, collection of, of user groups, of virtual groups on different topics, which meet, most of them meet monthly, either on a specific topic or in specific languages in areas around the world. So the next couple of slides, and Sunil, you can just slowly move through them, just gives you a taste of some of the upcoming virtual group sessions. All of them, like this one, is completely free, and you're more than welcome to join as many of those high-quality free training um, events provided by PASS. Next, Sunil. Um, as part of the rebranding, and you can see here um, the, the existing virtual groups, you can also see that our uh, logo has changed. I will prefer to refrain from commenting. I actually liked our previous logo better, but hey, now at least we got a consistent uh, logo for PASS and all the virtual groups. So yay for that. Next. SQL Saturdays. So if you haven't attended a SQL Saturday, it's a full day of free training. Um, which takes place in various places across the U.S. and the world. And um, if you go to SQLSaturday.com, you can get a list of all the upcoming events. Again, highly, highly recommended. Most of them are completely free. Some of them charge a minimum fee for lunch. Um, but you get high quality training speakers from all over the country and all over the world come speak at these events. If you haven't attended one, highly, highly recommend it. And even better, if there's one near you and you want to volunteer, um, I'm sure the organizers will be thrilled to get as many volunteers as they can for these events. Next. Um, yeah, and last, social media. Sign up at past.org. Sign up, follow our Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn account, Twitter hashtag SQL Pass. Um, and yeah, join the community, which makes all of this possible. So Sunil, without further ado, I hand over the microphone to you. Thank you very much. All right. Amy, thanks a lot. And uh, welcome everybody uh, in this conference. Amy, I have one quick question. Uh, in my slide, you may see this, uh, you know, control panel from this meeting. Is there a way for me to hide it? Uh, no, we don't see it, Sunil. It's okay. It's only visible on your screen. 
to okay. all right yeah so um, i've been with seco server team for 15 years and uh, for 2016 i was responsible from program manager perspective uh, column store technology so i'm pretty excited about presenting this technology uh, in this chapter and some of you might have seen a presentation like this before so what i did was i made some um, changes to this presentation and I'm focusing more on the kind of issues we have seen with our customers and uh, and hopefully uh, you will learn from those mistakes and I have come up with some sort of a best practices so that you can you know look at your column store implementation and say aha this is an issue and this is how I can address it and of course in one hour I cannot present everything so I've picked in uh, I've chose few items and um, and so, so that's where we are. So this is a outline and uh, even though we sent out a note saying that we expect people to have a basic understanding of column store, I want to take two or three slides to explain at a very high level what this technology is all about and what we have done for 2016. Uh, and I want to run through that in like 10 minutes. And then I will focus on data load strategies query performance guidelines, index fragmentation, how do you detect that, how do you fix that, in, in the summary. So that's the presentation here. So before I go and even go into the technology, I just wanted to show you a quick value proposition, what this technology can actually do for you. So what I have here is um, a, a AdventureWorks DW 2016 CTP3 database now people ask me, hey, why it is CTP3, why it is not RTM? I mean, there is a whole new debate inside our organization because column store as a functionality was enterprise only until SP1 came along, 2016 SP1. And we wanted to put out a AdventureWorks DW database that was available across all editions. So now it is available, so we will make some changes. So, so for now, just assume this is indeed a RTM database. So I'm just going to use this, right? And what I want to show you is a, a very simple query, which has a star schema join. So what you see here is a fact table on sales and it is joining on territory, employee, date, stuff like that, right? So so let me just run this query and uh, this table that I have, the fact table, is a row store table. It does not use column store and, uh, and it is reason A typical query that you will do in a in a data warehouse, and what you will see is this query. It has like a fact table has approximately 11 million rows, not a big table, but it's still not a small table. And what you will see is that this query runs in 30 to 40 seconds. Now, this was okay for for many customers because you know you run these reports or queries you know in the mornings or at uh, at whatever time but the the query performance or the runtime was not as critical right and here you notice that it took like 50 seconds to run this query on the bottom side but what we are seeing more and more is that analytics has become a tier 1 workload in the sense people want to use it every day all the time so they want to do analytics in a more performant way it's almost like an interactive analytics I want to you know, run a query and based on the results I want to do something more so those kind of things so it is important for us to do the queries in a much more efficient way so the columns flow technology actually is a tool uh, in your in your box to, to solve that problem. So, so you see that query that ran in uh, 56 seconds and what you need to do is to change the row store into column store you just run this command that I'm showing you here create cluster column store index on this table right and if you had a cluster index on this table what you will do you will drop that index like a drop existing and this table just by running this DDL command 
will transform from row store to a column store. So I don't want to do that here. It will take a few minutes. So I actually have a copy of the table, which I'm calling as fact reseller sales underscore CCI, right? Plus third column store index table. And I'm just going to run the query exactly the same, right? I run the query. And what you will see is that this query will run like it ran in four seconds. So from 56 seconds, it went down to four seconds. So if, it is, if you look at the improvement in the performance, it's like 14 times, right? Now, so this is the power of column store where you can improve the analytics without making any changes to your queries. Yes, you have to change the schema, right? You have use column store. So, so this is actually a huge benefit, right? By doing nothing, except creating column store, I'm getting such a huge performance. So that is one. And if you look at the storage, right? If you look at the storage, here the first space used is on a row store table, which you will see here is 2.5 gigabytes. And with the column store, the same table, same data, it is around 700 megabytes. So it's showing you approximately three times reduction in storage, right? And we have seen on average approximately 10x. This is like a, you know, a benchmark kind of a workload where, you know, data is not as, uh, I mean, it's very random data, so it does not compress as well. If you look at a lot of customer workloads, they compress pretty good. So the column store in a nutshell is a technology that can save you in a storage approximately 10x and it can speed up your analytics up to 100 times, up to 100 times, it's huge without making any changes. So that's the value proposition of this technology. And this technology was introduced in SQL Server 2012 and, uh, and we introduced uh, a clustered column store index, the one that I just showed you in 2014 and it was updatable. What it means is that you could run the queries analytics while you're doing the data load. That was not possible in 2012. And in 2016, we have done more improvements. So at a high level, a column store index is essentially the same table, the same relational table, except that the data is stored as columns. It's not stored as rows. So what you see here is a table with five columns, and I'm storing column C1 independently uh, to column C2 and so on. So what it means is because I'm storing each column independently, I can compress the data much, much better because that's the same data type. And secondly, because a lot of times the values are very similar, right? So for example, employees, Microsoft employees in the state of Washington, the city most likely will be Redmond, right? So there's a lot of repetition of the values. You can get very good compression. So because of that, uh, we can, uh, minimize the I.O. impact on the query performance because analytics, you know, today people have analytics databases which are in terabytes. So the question is when I'm munching through a lot of data, typically I get bottleneck on my I.O. Yes, SSDs and all those fast I.O. devices have made that, you know, I.O. bottleneck less, but still the point is it can bottleneck. So that is one uh, aspect that column store addresses. Now the second important thing is because each column is stored independently, if I'm running a query and my query is, let's say, accessing column C1 and C2, okay? I'm taking a very simple example. Then I do not need to read columns C3, C4, and C5, right? Because I can ignore them. I could not do that in the row store model because when I read a page, the page has one or more rows and the row has all the columns. So I could not say to SQL Server before column store came along, I just want to read those two columns, right? So assume that all values are same size, which is pretty radical uh, assumption. If I assume that, if I just picking columns C1 and C2, right here, I reduced my IO by 60%, right? Because uh, I don't need to read C3, C4, C5. And if you assume that I have compressed my data 10 times, so 
that 40% became 4%, right? Because I reduced 10 times. So essentially, for this query example in a very simplistic way, I reduce my I.O. 96%. And if you think about it, that's huge. And that is one of the key reasons why queries get much, much better performance with column store, right? And the third thing that we have done is uh, we introduced a, a unique execution model for column store queries, which we call batch mode execution. And at a very high level, what batch mode is, instead of processing data one value at a time, which was fine for transactional workload, but it is not fine for analytics, because in analyt analytics, you are processing billions or billions of rows, so you want to uh, process those rows in a much more efficient way. And what batch mode does, it, it picks uh, a set of rows and typically it is around 900 values. It's so SQL server will say when processing through column store, give me the next 900 values. If I wanted to say aggregate a sales, I can say okay, give me the next 900 values of the sales and the next 900. And by doing that, you know, it gets a lot of locality of uh, uh, execution and, uh, and efficiencies because imagine if you're calling a stored procedure 900 times versus one time, right? So those kind of things have given SQL Server column store a edge over the competition. When I say edge, edge over the competition, the column store is not unique to Microsoft, but the implementation that Microsoft has uh, has delivered much, much superior performance for, for uh, column store technology. Now, there are two concepts that are very important, and I think uh, some of the presentations, uh, demos that I'll do are useful. So, what we do is, let's say you have a table with 100 million rows, right? We don't compress 100 million values of column C1 together, because if we do, then if I want to read any value, I have to read those 100 million values, right? So what we do is we break those rows into units of 1 million. That is a row group. So what you can see here, a table uh, in a very simplistic way, with two million rows, it has two row groups, right? Two row groups, and uh, and the column C1 for row group one, I'm talking about uh, this guy, will have one million values, and this will have one million values, right? Okay. Now this one million is not strict; that is the ideal size that we want, but there are many situations where a row group size will be less than a million. But for simplicity, assume it is million, right? Okay. Now each of these uh, column units are actually called segments. So the storage unit in a column store is a segment. So here you can imagine I'm storing 10 segments, right? Two row groups. And these segments are stored as lob data. So they are on pages but stored as a lob. So one important thing is since it is stored as a lob, when you access column store, those data, if it is not in memory, you will be accessed from disk into memory. And if it is not needed, eventually it will be cached out, right? So the thing is, there is no requirement that the column store index, the cluster column store index, or the non-cluster needs to be in memory. It is not required, okay? So I think that's all I wanted to say about the column store. And this is the important slide, which is showing you the TPCH benchmark. This is an industry standard benchmark. And you see that, you know, like the, this was the last one was done in 16. I might be missing the new one. The top six, right, the top six or seven, all are on SQL Server, right? SQL Server 14 and then you 16, right? So we are beating the competition in a big way on a SMP box. I'm not talking about a scale out model I'm talking about SMP box and this benchmark was done on a 10 terabyte database which is no uh, is a reasonable size a lot of customers have 10 terabytes or less right so we are leading there similarly same benchmark on 30 terabyte again SQL server is a leader so the thing is with SQL server column store you are working with the technology that is the leader in the marketplace the second thing I want to show you and then we'll just go into the meat of the presentation that we ran the same benchmark on a 3 terabyte database, TPCH database, and what we found was on the same hardware, the SQL 16 performance is 40% better 
than what it was in 2014. And the reason is we have invested big time in column store technology in 2016 to deliver even more performance and value to our customers. Okay, so 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 if you are thinking about using column store technology with SQL Server, if you can, we highly recommend you to move to 2016 or even better, 2016 SP1, where you can use this technology even on standard edition. Okay. Now, uh, because we will talk about query performance, uh, there are a few things that are important that we did in 2016 for column store index, right? So in 2014, this is how the column store looked like. You know, this the the maroon bars that you see, these are the segments, right? Row groups. And there is something called uh, delta row group, which is you are seeing in a you know yellow line. This is uh, a delta row group, and the concept of delta row group is when you are inserting rows into column store, we cannot compress one or two rows. We need to accumulate million rows before we can compress them. So for that million rows are sitting in this delta row group, which could be one or more. And once they exceed a million, we close them, or they reach million, we close them, and then we compress them. Okay, and there's a delete bitmap in the sense, you know, if you delete a row, we just mark the row as deleted. We just cannot remove the row physically from the compressed data because it'll be too expensive. So this is what you had in 2014. The change we made for 2016 is now with 2016 you can create one or more traditional non-cluster indexes on a table with a column store. Right? So this is a a huge functionality for us. It allows us to do many things. Number one, you can create uh, primary key indexes. You can enforce foreign key in a more efficient way, right? Because if you have a primary key, because you can just create a NCI, the non cluster index, and it will be enforced. Previously, without this functionality, you could not enforce it because column store rows are not ordered. And all these indexes, NCIs, allow you to run queries which are for equality or for short range queries in a much more efficient way. And so, so those are actually some of the benefits. And uh, one interesting thing came out of this one was because we have NCI, we can use NCI to give you row level locking, which was not possible in 2014 for updates and deletes. For row inserts, it was row level locking, but for updates and deletes, it was locking at a row group level. The row group level is million rows. That's a huge, you know, uh, lock. And if there were two transactions that want to update a row, two different rows on the same row group, they will get blocked. But not anymore with NCI. So that is a huge functionality for us. Second thing that we have done is uh, we now support RCSI and snapshot isolation on table with column store. This was not supported in 2014. Now the challenge there was that if my analytics needs to have a transactionally consistent data, it will block. It will block if you are running that concurrently with the data load. But now with SCRCSI or snapshot isolation, you are actually fine, right? A lot of our customers in 2014 ran analytics under no lock, like a dirty read. But it is acceptable in certain scenarios, but not in all scenarios. So that's something you have now. We already talked about row level locking, both for updates and deletes. Now, the because now snapshot isolation is available on column store, you can run a column store index query on a secondary replica in a always on configuration, which was not possible uh, before. This is also actually very useful because, as I was telling you, that the, uh, the analytics is not a secondary workload anymore. It is a mission critical tier one workload. And we have seen customers deploying analytics in an always on configuration where you have primary and a secondary replica. The reason they do it, because they don't want to have a downtime. And now, because I can offload my queries on secondary replica as well, you can scale out your uh, analytics with 2016, all right? So this is pretty much at a very high level what we have done for the uh, column store. Now let us look at the data load. Now 
clearly when you think about analytics, right, at the crux of analytics, essentially what it is, you are getting data from outside, whether it is coming every day or a week, every hour or every five minutes, I don't care, right? You're getting data. So data has to be inserted into this column store index uh, efficiently, right? So, so the question is, what are the best practices? And one of the things that I found that people are, in fact, uh, you will be surprised that there was a group within uh, the building I work in, their data load was running very slow and they contacted me and I was surprised they were not using the right batch size to load the data. So, so I think it is important. So what it shows here is if I'm inserting the data bulk import, when I say bulk import, I'm saying I'm reading data from a file like the BCP or the bulk insert. If the size of the batch is less than 100,000, that data lands in this yellow box, which is the delta row group. And uh, there are two disadvantages with that. Number one, eventually this yellow data has to be converted to compressed data, so there is extra copy going on, right? It's not good. Number two, the transaction logs for the yellow guy is not as efficient. I'm going to show you an example, right? If you want to do a bulk load in parallel, you know, you can do another BCP and it will load into a new delta row group, right? So you can have multiple delta row groups created automatically. You do not have to worry about that. And key thing to note is that each delta row group is locked like an X lock. Like so, so only one bulk import can uh, happen on a single delta row group, right? So, so key point is, uh, if the batch size is less than 100,000, you can load in parallel, but it is not efficient. So what you can do, you can say, I'm going to specify a batch size of greater than 100,000. Then what we do, we have this minimal bar. If it is more than 100,000, we will directly compress the data and, and load it there. Now the benefit here is you avoid one copy. And, uh, and, uh, and in fact, the logging is much, much lower, right? So, so our recommendation to a customer says, make sure your batch size is over 100,000. Now this 100,000 is not 100, 00, 00. It's not decimal 100,000. It is binary, which is 102400. Okay? So just be careful with that. So, so, so that's, uh, that's how we recommend. So that is one way. This, and I think one thing I want to show you that the bulk import we have measured with the column store, this was done in 2014 time frame. We have not changed that uh, performance we were able to load 600 gigabyte into column store per hour on a 16 core machine. Now clearly, if you have a 64 core machine, you could load uh, proportionally at a much higher rate, right? Because there is no bottleneck per se. Of course, if this becomes a bottleneck, it becomes a bottleneck. But you can partition the data, you can do many, many things. So you can load in a pretty scalable way. So that's actually pretty good. Uh, second thing, the way people load the data is through staging table because you bring the data in, you run some sort of a transformations, and then you load the data into column store. So what I'm showing you here is a staging table, right? Row storage staging table. You assume you clean it up, and then you want to insert into column store, and uh, that's how the command will be run, right? Again, the same rule holds. If you have less than 100,000 rows, it goes into yellow guy. Not good right, because you are not getting the efficiencies of logging as well as extra copy. But if you have more than 100,000, it goes over there, right, compressed. This is what you want, okay. All right, so now let me just go to a demo uh, to show you this uh, magic of data load. So what I'll do is uh, I'll go to my bulk load uh, scenario. I'm going to open a file here and uh, I go to bulk load and um, column store bulk insert. Okay. So what I do here is I have a table. I have a table, right? And um, I think let me just uh, drop and recreate. So this is a simple uh, table that I created and I'm going to create a column store index on it. Okay, so I'm creating a clustered column store index on it. Okay, so I'm done. 
Now, what I did was I created a couple of files to load data from, so let's not worry about that, right? So what I'm going to do is um, I want to show you first a, a simple bulk load, okay? So I'm saying begin transaction, bulk insert into this table, and I'm loading data from a file that has 10,000 rows. And I'm going to take a table lock. And the reason I'm mentioning table lock here is because if you remember with the row store, one of the bulk load techniques we tell people is use tab lock for concurrent bulk load because behind the scene we optimize the lock as a BU lock, which is bulk update lock. Now the bulk update lock does not work with column store because column store you can load data in parallel without the BU lock, right? Because each of the row groups are almost independent tables. I mean, uh, in a very loosely way, I'm saying those are independent row groups. So you can load the data directly into them, right? So let me just do that. I'm saying begin transaction and load the data, okay? So I'm just going to execute this command. So the 10,000 rows have been inserted. Now, if I want to show you the lock, okay, I'm going to go and file and see what locks were taken. So show monitor locks, okay? I'm going to go here. And if I want to show you the locks, and uh, what you will see is, I'm just going to run this command and show you the locks that are being taken. And what you see is, it is taking the lock, X lock on the row group, which what you expect, right? But it is also taking a X lock on the table itself. Now what it means is, if you were going to do uh, import into this table through multiple files, only one of the commands will go through, others will wait because it is not a BU lock, it is an X lock. So this is actually a very important point to make sure that when you are bulk importing data into column store, do not use tab lock. Do not use tab lock if you are looking for parallel data load. Okay? So I'm going to roll back this guy. Okay? That is one important thing. The second thing that I have done here is I'm going to uh, show you the transaction logs that were generated. So I have a uh, if a query that I run to showcase the logs. Okay, so here in my adventure works, I'm going to do a checkpoint, and I want to show you that for this table, there is no log because you know it is in simple recovery mode. I did a checkpoint, logs got cleaned up. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a a data load and I have a file which has 110,000 rows, okay, 110,000. So definitely it is more than 100,000 rows, okay. So what I'm doing is I'm saying load that, oh, let me first make sure the transaction is rolled back. I think it is rolled back, okay. So I'm going to do this command and I say batch size is 110,000. Uh, so what will happen is that it is loading the rows but the batch size is 10,000. It is not going to compress them. It's going to load 10,000 rows per batch into the delta row group, okay? So I'm going to just run this guy. So it will go through and, and unload the data into uh, delta row group. Now if I want to see the log, right, uh, it will be pretty large number of log records, but what I want to show you is let me find the total log that was done, the total sum of the log that we did, and I'm going to run this command, and I'm going to note it down. So this is I did the bulk load, and it, if you notice here, it is 7.5 megabytes worth of transaction log that was generated, all right? Okay. So I'm going to go back to my bulk load command, and I'm going to, let's say, commit this guy, commit, and, uh, and then what I'll do is I'll truncate the table. I just want to start both, uh, for both scenarios. I'm going to truncate the table, no row left, and I go to my logs and I'm going to run a checkpoint. I'm going to run a checkpoint so that it is cleaned up, right? And if I do a this thing, you'll see there's no log left, okay? So what I did was I uh, inserted 110,000 rows in a, from a single file, but I chose a batch size of 10,000. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same command, same command, but I'm not going to use batch size of 10,000, right? I'm just going to say, just load it. So I go here, uh, all right, no batch size. 
So here, the 110,000 rows will be compressed directly. But I think the interesting thing for us is to see what is the total log generated. Remember, previously it was 7.5 megabytes. And if you look at it here, it is 205 kilobytes, right? So it is 5 into 7, that is 35. So essentially, it is genera uh, generating uh, uh, approximately 37 times less transaction log, right? So, so the key takeaway is make sure your batch size is uh, much larger. Sorry, the batch size is larger than 100,000. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, um, go back to my command and uh, mark this transaction as commit. All right. Okay. All right. So this is when it was running under simple recovery mode. I have the same example uh, on on a full recovery mode. So let me just try that example. I'm going to uh, close this guy. I'm going to close locks and I'm going to close logs. Okay. So I'm going to go here, open, and I'm going to file. And I'm going to do a database with a full recovery mode, which is here, bulk load. And you see the full recovery and the full recovery log. Those are the two things I want to see. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to create a database column store, right? Create a database, and I mark it as full recovery mode, and I just do a database backup, so that you know once I do the ba uh, backup of my full recovery database, then uh, uh, full recovery mode is on. Okay, so I'm going to use column store. All right. I'm going to uh, drop this table, same table that I had created before but it is in the full recovery mode. And the reason I'm mentioning this one is because if you are running column store under always on configuration, you have to have full recovery mode, right? So I'm going to create a column store index on it. And, uh, and then I'm just going to run, you know, the same command like I did before. And in the full recovery log, I want to make sure there is um, no log right now because I want to compare the size of the log, okay? Okay, there is some log. I'm going to do a backup. I'm going to checkpoint and a backup. And now if I show you, there is no log, right? Okay. Now what I'm going to do is uh, full recovery. Okay. So let me run this command, okay? Now the thing that I want to tell you is that when I ran this command on a database with the uh, simple recovery mode, I got around 7.5 megabyte worth of log, right? Now let us see how much log I get now. Clearly, it will be much larger, but let's just measure it, okay? And notice it is taking much, much longer to do the sum, and it will come out pretty high number. So, and the reason is, in the full recovery mode, it is logging the full row length, right? So here, if you notice, it is 884, and 2 to 9, 136 megabytes, right? It has gone up many, many folds because I'm running full recovery mode, right? Okay. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to commit this transaction, commit this transaction, and um, and uh, and then I'm going to go and clean up my log records, right? I'm going to go and clean up my log records because I want to uh, measure the size of my transaction log when I'm inserting into the same table but with a batch size of over hundred thousand dollars hundred thousand okay so if I look at the log here nothing right so I go back to my recovery mode uh, this the full recovery uh, file and now notice I'm going to load my file of hundred ten thousand rows as a single batch that means this data is getting compressed directly right? You notice it came back much, much faster. And if I look at the log size here, it is like less than a megabyte. And that was around 136 megabyte. So anyway, so I think you get the idea that whether you're running under simple recovery mode or full recovery mode, it is to your advantage to make sure your batch size is over 100,000, right? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move away from uh, this uh, demo. I commit. I think I'm set. So I'm just gonna remove this file and on uh, and move to the query performance now. All right. 
So in the query performance, the thing that I want to focus on, two things. First is the row group elimination. I think it's a very important point and I want to use that point to even illustrate to you should you partition your column stored index or not for better query performance. So here what you see is a, a table with column stored index, sales table and uh, it has you know two row groups. I'm showing you two row groups which is you know here and here and the reason you see different sizes because each column will compress differently, right? Okay. So when I run this query, uh, this query you might have seen in earlier presentations of column store, but it is important to understand this and then I'll build a demo on this one. So here, first thing you notice is that this query is using three columns, right? Product key, sales amount, and order date key. So these three columns that I pointed out, store key, region key, quantity is not referenced. It does not have to be fetched, right? That's one. This is column elimination, very intuitive. Now the second thing is that order date key is less than this. So what we do is for each of these segments, these are called segments, right? Each segment that we have, we maintain in a metadata, the min and the max value. So by looking at order date key segments, I can figure out which segments can have a value in the range that is requested in the query, right? And, and based on that, I may eliminate some segments, right? If I eliminate a segment, the whole row group is eliminated. And this is pretty much what I'm showing you, right? Now, the important thing to note is, like, you know, if you have billion rows or 10 billion rows, and if you're running a query, and that query has to scan the 10 billion rows, you can imagine it will be very inefficient, right? It will be, you know, size of data operation, it will take much longer. So it is in our interest to make sure that's the row group elimination happens, right? And uh, and I'll show you the impact of row group elimination, and also show you the techniques where you can improve the row group elimination, right? So let me go to the row group elimination. So um, Amy, I want to stop here for a second to see if there's a question, and otherwise I just go into my demo. So we had um, a few questions. I believe I answered most of them. Okay. There All is right. a question now um, whether row group elimination or segment elimination are the same thing. Right. Yeah. So it's a it's a very uh, confusing topic. Um, unfortunately, if you look at our messages today, also we sometimes overload uh, row group elimination as segment elimination. So. Uh, so for now, um, they are one and the same thing. Now, when we talk about segment elimination because we're eliminating certain columns, we don't call that a segment elimination. That is called column elimination. So yeah, it is confusing. There's a historical reason to it, and unfortunately, we could not change it. All right. All right. So, so here, what I want to do is I want to go back to the database that I had. And what I did was, uh, this is actually important. So I have a table called CCI test, cluster column store index test, right? Uh, pretty dumb name, but that's what I got. So what I did was uh, it had 11 million rows. So I, what I did was I copied that table into a new table called CCI test ordered. Okay, I just said, you know, select star into the CCI test ordered and whatever, right? I did that. And now what I did was I created a traditional cluster index on it, on organization key. So what it means is my data got sorted on the organization key, right? This is what cluster index will do. And then what I did was I said create cluster column store index on that table, which was row store cluster index. And I said create a cluster column store index drop existing with the DOP one. So what happens now is when I do that, my column store index, when it gets created, it will be perfectly ordered on organization key, all right? So I did that. So I want to show you the this ordering, and I have two tables. One is a CCI test that you see here, right? And I'm saying, show me, show me for each segment of organization key, which is column ID 3, 
what is the range? And what you see here is the min is 3 and the max is 13. Min is 3, max is 13. That means all row groups in my column store index have a min and a max for organization key to be exactly the same. Right? Okay. Now, in the ordered scenario where I created a cluster index, and if I run the same query, what you will see is it is ordered, right? 3, comma 3, 3, 4, 4. You see what I mean? It is ordered. Okay, so now if I run the query, so I'm going to have a stats on, both things on, and I'm going to run the query. We say select min of multiple columns where organization key is greater than 12. Now, if I was running this query on CCI test, I really cannot eliminate any row group, right? So let me run this guy. And what you will see is that it did not skip any segment. Now, the question that was asked, Amy, was it should have said row group skipped zero. But we say segment skipped zero, and again, for the historical reason, right? So it had to read everything. And notice it took like CPU time of 182nd, 86 milliseconds and elapsed time of 128. Uh, not too bad, but that's what we got. Now, if I run the same query on the order table, right, it came a little bit faster, but it is, you know, blinking an eye thing. But notice, it is so much faster that it, you know, it was less than a millisecond thing from a CPU time, right? So, so I think the key point to note is that segment elimination or the row group elimination is your friend you want to make sure you are eliminating those segments because that can speed up the query performance, right? Okay. So, so that's the motivation I wanted to give you. And I want to go now to my uh, scenario that I think is important uh, in this case. Okay. So we had a customer that we were working with. And, uh, and I want to sort of describe this in a few minutes so that you understand the, the impact. So what they had was, uh, they uh, had uh, First American is a, is a real estate uh, title company. And what they had was, they had a database. They, in fact, have it in production today. They have a database with 150 million properties in US. These are pretty much all the properties in US. And, and those properties have 150 attributes, right? You know, price and the number of bedrooms and the backyard size. I mean, you name it, they have it. So people run the queries, say, you know, show me a property that matches my criteria, which is like three bedrooms, two baths, you know, school, district, and all kinds of stuff, right? And you can imagine people run those queries with different criteria, because different criteria matter to different people, right? Okay. And, uh, and their queries return 10 plus columns, hundreds of rows, right? This is pretty much uh, what this application is. And, uh, and they update a million rows per day, which is quite a bit of updates. And think of this, right? The house tax changes every year, right? So 150 million properties, you can imagine on average you are changing 300,000 rows per day, right? So a lot of changes. Okay. So their solution was that, well, uh, they had a row store implementation. Now, in order to improve the query performance, they wanted to have indexes, the non-cluster indexes on those tables, right? Because if you have non-cluster index, I can apply those predicates, search criteria quickly, and I can give the results back. Now, because their queries could come on any column, any filter, in an ideal world, they wanted to have 150 indexes, one on each column, right? Now, imagine if you have one index on each column, your ETL will die, will literally die. I mean, each insert will cause you know, 150 inserts, right? So, so that was the problem they had. Now, the point I'm making you here is that they moved this, this implementation to cluster column store index, and they removed all the indexes, okay? They loaded the rows, and they were unordered, right? So they had 150 million rows loaded into column store. So imagine there were, in the best case, 150 row groups. So now what happened when they run the queries, right, they have, say, five predicates or six predicates. And what happened was uh, we ran these numbers, and we were surprised by the query performance. It was pretty phenomenal. And the reason it happened, because when I give five or six predicates, 
we were able to eliminate segments in a very big way. We, or I'm going to say row group for this presentation. We were able to eliminate row groups because predicate one may say that for predicate one, only these 30 row groups will qualify. Then I apply predicate two, it narrowed further. So ultimately what happened, we came down to two or three row groups that were all that were needed for satisfying that query. And because of that, the query ran amazingly fast. And I want to show you a very quick uh, snippet on that. So first of all, their compression was 13 times. They went from 560 gigabyte to 30, 44 gigabyte, pretty huge. And their CPU usage went down from 23% to 7%. They have, of course, a provision for the peak performance. But on average, their CPU was 23%. But with column store index, it went to 7% because you know, we are doing less I.O., which means less I.O. processing, but we do batch mode processing, everything like that, right? But the most important thing was they got 60 times improvement in the query performance, right? And now beauty is, because there is no index, their ETL was much, much faster, right? And it all happened because of segment elimination or the row group elimination, because without that, we had to scan 150 million rows, and I can bet you will not get that kind of a performance, right? So, so I'm saying, in your queries, when you run the query and the query is not performing well, the first thing you should see is, uh, yes, are you running the query in batch mode? But the important thing is, are you getting any segment eliminations, okay? Now, I want to uh, showcase uh, segment elimination as another important point for determining if you should partition your table or not, right? So question is, column store index, should I partition it? Okay. Now, interesting thing is that column store index has a natural partitioning through the row groups because when you are inserting rows, you have these, you know, behind the scene partitions which have million rows, right? And and that partition has partition boundaries, right? Because you have min and max for each of those columns in the row group, right? And you know the interesting thing is like in a in a common case for business where they're inserting data in a temporal way, right? Data is coming in a time order fashion, like sales data you're inserting the rows, so naturally what happens is the data is gets ordered in the date time fashion, right? So if I'm saying run the query for my last quarter, chances are you will only look at the row groups which are for the last quarter, right? Because you will eliminate everything else because date will not match. So this happens automatically. So the question people ask is, hey, then if it is happening for me, should I partition my table, which is column store, because column store is doing it. So the, the scenarios that uh, we actually came up with where partitioning will help are these. So if your data is not naturally ordered, so for example, it is not coming at date time. So one a good example would be, you know, the real estate data that we just talked about, it is not time based, it is just coming, it is changing all the time because you are changing the tax on the house, the ordering gets completely messed up, right? And and you have some column that is used for filtering, right? You can imagine if I uh, leave it the way it is, the query performance will not be good because I have to pretty much scan all the row groups, right? So what you can do is, in the in the real estate organization thing, that example we gave, let's say the common filtering happens by state or by county because, you know, I'm in, say, I live in King County in Washington. I'm not going to look for a house in King County. I'm not going to look for a house in a different county, right? Most likely, right? So if you partition the data that way, you are limiting the data set. You know, there are like things, there are 5,000 counties in US somewhere there. So you are, you see what I'm doing? I'm limiting the data in a, in a very, and the reason I'm doing it, because partitioning is a way for me to eliminate row groups, okay? That's one example. Another example, like sales data we just talked about, where data is coming in the say in the date time order, right? But if your analytics is done at a stake level, you say, I want to just find out what was the sales, the average sales, and whatever not in the state of Washington or a state of New York and stuff like that. So having a partition on on those states could help, right? So so those are the things you need to be cognizant of. Okay. Now, uh, remember I talked about NCI. Let me just show you how NCI has speed up our query performance. I know I have only five minutes left, and so I will not be able to uh, go through uh, a whole lot of things. So I actually want to skip this demo, 
and uh, and show you something uh, a bit more interesting about more interesting okay which is uh, what happens when my index gets fragmented so uh, my apologies I think this uh, maybe we should divide this presentation into two parts uh, so I'm gonna go and do a query performance and this is actually pretty interesting I'm gonna open a file and uh, I have a fragmentation okay so here what I have is I have my database okay and uh, I you know what I did I have done this before coming here so I create the table and then what I did was I updated 60 percent of the rows right so update this command I ran so this table because I updated so many rows and this was a compressed table so 60 percent of the rows that I have in my table are actually uh, um, uh, deleted and I'm going to show you how they look like okay if I go here you will see that I have bunch of deleted rows right bunch of deleted rows okay now if you have a fragmentation in your database in your column row table the query performance will suffer and I want to show you that example okay I run the query uh, and I'm running this query on a table that was not fragmented okay that was not fragmented and and the fragmented table is the CCI test fragment okay so if I run the query and uh, here and I run it and you will see the query performance CPU time for 20 second milliseconds right and and if I run that thing on a same data but I have like a bunch of deleted rows and you will see it is taking almost eight times more so the point I'm making is that if you have a bunch of deleted rows in your column store your query performance will increasingly become bad and bad and bad so what you could do is you can defragment the data this is something that we provide in SQL Server 2016 and what you need to do is I'm just going to run that command uh, to show you I go here to demos and I go to supportability and what you can do is you can run this command uh, reorganize alter index reorganize and what it will do is it will remove the deleted rows based on certain policy from those uh, row groups and your row groups will become healthy again and then it can improve the query performance so I think it is 1057 I would like to stop here so the key thing I'm trying to show you is that segment elimination is extremely important fragmentation you should watch out for and this reorganizes an online operation that you could do and um, and I had something about uh, aggregate push down and how to make it effective but unfortunately I cannot do that session uh, I have blogged about that part so please look for that blog uh, Amy I know I'm running out of time so I'll take questions if they are available and uh, Yes, so we had a few questions. I believe I answered most of them. Okay. Um, also, I see that you asked a question at the chat or, uh, oh, yeah, well, anyway. Um, any other questions, people? So Sunil, my, maybe we'll talk about it later, maybe it will be a good idea to make a part two of this presentation and um, go over all the demos and the topics that you didn't have time today. It seems like there's plenty of them. Right, right. I think we could do that if there's an interest. Okay. Um, Paresh asks about um, query plans. Yep. Um, he wanted to see the query plan. Um, I believe you will share the the code, so right. pe people can experiment with that. So I'm sorry about that, Paresh. Um, we won't have time to show that um, in the earlier slide. For the real American finance, you mentioned a load balance SQL Server. How did they do that? Load balance SQL Server. Let me just see what you're referring to. This is from Jeremy. Jeremy, where did you see the load balance? Oh, all right. 
uh, I think this is where you are doing. So basically what they had was um, they uh, had a scaled out model because they just duplicated the data on three servers because they wanted to make sure they can handle the peak. So and they were thinking about moving into always on scenario because column store index did not support offloading queries on the secondary replicas uh, before. This was 2014 implementation for them. So yes. Um, another question from Jason, does using an NCI, I assume he means NCCI, slow OLTP data top operations more than traditional indexes? No, NCI means traditional B3 index. It is not NCCI. You cannot create an NCCI on a cluster column store index table. This is the traditional B3 index. The way I think about this index is, uh, uh, Jason, is you know, the cluster column store index is not really an index. It is a storage format. So the way I think about the table is a heap, which is stored in the column store format. And the reason I say that, because cluster column store index does not have a key column. The data is not ordered. So it's a heap in the column store storage model. And what NCIs I'm talking about are the regular B3 indexes that you would create on a heap. Here, you're just creating them on a column store table. But we can do the opposite, right? We can have a clustered index with non-clustered column That's store right. indexes, yes. right? You can, have, you can have. Would these incur um, more of an overhead than B tree and non-clustered indexes? Right. So, so the question. Uh, this is a great question. Is, is N, uh, okay? You're talking about. See, first of all. NCI that you create in a cluster column sort index is like a, another NCI, right? The leaf node will point to a red, which in this case is a row group, and the row within that uh, row, uh, row group, okay? Unlike in the traditional sense where you have a page ID and the row within the row page, right? Okay. NCCI is a lot more expensive for maintenance than a NCI, right? Uh, and I think that is um, something uh, needs, uh, I think I have a slide on this one. In fact, I have a blog on this one. If you can search through that, we can send you the link. Uh, yeah, it is a little bit more expensive and, uh, and we have techniques, we have configurations to minimize that impact. Great. And I think with that uh, optimistic note, I will stop the recording now.